This morning, uh, before we have an opportunity for a call to worship and do some music, would you mind just standing? And if you would shake the hands of somebody nearby, if you don't know somebody, introduce yourself and make a friend. Your business can't be shaking your hand. <laughs>
service here today. But this time we're going to pause to uh, take our uh, morning tithes and offerings. If you are a guest with us today, this is the part of the service that you do not need to participate in. But if you call this your church home, this is your opportunity to give in the bowl that's provided in the back. There's also, uh, today is five on five, the Netherlands Sunday. Well, we have three months during the year where we have five Sundays, and what we do is we, um, those of us who are convicted, give five dollars to represent the fifth Sunday, and that money goes to benevolence to help any uh, needs that might come up with individuals within our congregation. So there are envelopes provided where you can put that into the regular offering, or if you just have loose change, you can put it in the uh, box, giving box back there. So let's just pray God's blessings upon the offerings, and then you may um, go to the back area. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us today. Thank you for meeting all of our needs. Every day you are so good to us. We are just overwhelmed when we really stop and we pause and we reflect on all the things that you provide for us. When we see a world at war and we see countries where people are starving and trying to steal for food, and Father, we have, we have way more than enough here. And Father, you have called us to be obedient, to, to give back to you today. And so Father, I pray that we would give with generous hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, we're also collecting uh, goods today for our North End Community Ministry, as you can see. Um, you can bring, if you brought food today, you can bring that up and place it at the foot of the cross. Uh, next week we'll have a table and we'll have all that food arranged so a little, little prettier than just in the bags and the sacks. Our offertory thought today is when you think of your money, does your heart hold or does it release? If it can release, it's not selfish gain. If it can, it might be lingering beneath the surface. One way God helps us fight against grasping so tightly onto our money that it gets in the way of God's testimonies to us is to give to the church. God tells us to do it, and he knows it's an ailment for our hearts that are often inclined towards selfishness. Would you release your heart today and give to God as we incline our heart toward his testimony? Father, we're so thankful today that you've promised 
that you would come alongside us, that you would walk with us through every experience of our lives. And Father, for those of us that have even included you into our life during those moments, we have found that peace. We can't explain it. It's just there. We, we experience your presence, and it is a lift. It is a help and an encouragement through very dark days. So I pray that we would uh, give all of our concerns to you and that, Father, as you uh, take care of them, you would walk alongside us and remind us that, Father, even though we have to experience these through your Son, Jesus, you have overcome the world. And, Father, we're thankful today that you have overcome death. We thank you that, Father, for the believer, there is the hope of eternal life. And, Father, as we have just recently uh, lost three members from our church here, Father, we rejoice today that they are in your presence because, Father, they chose you and they chose to live their life the best they could, faithfully. <coughs> so, Father, today, again, as we would celebrate another one of our loved ones, Father, that is with you today, might we have the peace in our hearts to know where they're at. But may we be challenged to look at our own lives to make sure that we're, we're living the way you would want us to live that we would receive you into our hearts and that, Father, we would be able to receive all the good gifts and promises that you give to those who choose to be your children. Father, today we bring to you uh, Bob Mo. We are so grateful that he might be coming home today or tomorrow. Father, we just pray that you would be with him. We know he has had a very difficult life with health issues. And Father, we're so thankful today that you have preserved and protected him during this last episode, and we just pray that you would give him the complete healing he needs and give Linda peace of mind as she would care for him. We pray for our good brother Ron, who's here today, and we just ask that you would be with him through his cancer and diagnosis and treatment, that Father, he would just have a measurable sense of extra strength and vitality that he knows comes from you alone. Father, we pray today for this family and role that has lost this little four-year-old boy to the fighter. Father, we can't imagine what it would be like to experience anything like this. And Father, we just pray today that you would be with a father who is in the burn unit at the hospital, the ICU unit here in Grand Rapids, and that Father, you would just administer him of the care that he needs. We pray that you would uh, help and bless the doctors and the nurses and the, and the care team that take care of him. And Father, we pray more than anything that you would just help him emotionally today. It must be so difficult to lie in so much pain and discomfort and to know that your, your heart is breaking as well. Father, we know that you know exactly what needs to be done in that situation. Father, today you've seen our hands walk across, across the congregation of concerns that we face that, Father, we just pray for day after day. We don't know what else to do sometimes other than just to pray. And, Father, help us to have faith to believe that you are bigger than our Open our ears now and our eyes to the message that will be shared. Might it just speak to us? Might we feel God's presence with us today as we honor our life? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time, I believe our Jesus and Me program will be dismissed.
and we would talk. And it would be often that during that time that topics were brought up or things were shared about our lives that were attached with all kinds of feelings and emotions. I remember there were times when there were things at the table that nobody could believe and our mouths all dropped. There were things shared at the table where uh, we, were, we were grieving and we cried. And we were worried or we were trying to encourage or give advice to somebody in the family that was struggling. So today we come to the table and Jesus gains his rightful spot at the table in our lives. Today he reminds us, and this is our theme today, that we are to see the beauty and value in each other that he sees in all of us. Now I know it might be a little uncomfortable for you to look around and just kind of look at everybody. You had a chance in the beginning, but I might just kind of look around and see the faces here today. And I want you to just think for a minute how much God sees beauty and value in each face that you look at. Isn't it? We can comprehend the beauty and the value that God sees in each one of us. And if we did, how much more we would love each other, we would accept each other, we would embrace each other, we would want to be with each other. Because that's just the qualities that come with that. So for many today, there is a struggle in their own personal lives to accept others who are different from them. We see this all across the world, don't we? We see it in our communities. Some people only look for the good qualities in people, and if that person doesn't have enough good qualities, then they dismiss them, or they avoid or neglect them. And we see that happening all around in our society and in our world. People today are avoided by the color of their skin, by the language that they speak, by the clothing that they wear, by the nationality group that they represent, by their political positions. People are neglected and avoided because of the religious or the religion that they adhere to for any number of reasons. But if we truly remind ourselves that God has created each one of us in his own image, that he has set his specific purpose in each one of our hearts, each one of us that he has created and each one of us that he hopes will choose his ways and to fulfill the purposes that he has for each of our lives, that he has given good qualities to each and every one of us in this room. He has given each and every one of us potential and abilities to all of us. Maybe we could begin to see others a little more like what God sees in others. People are beautiful, aren't they? you really think about it, people are beautiful creations. And yet we, we see so much in the world where people are, are seen as objects to get something, or are mistreated, or are abused, or uh, their lives are even disregarded and taken for cause. People are beautiful and they're valuable in God's sight. God made every single one of us in this room. And if he didn't want us to be here with a purpose, guess what? We wouldn't be here today, would we? We would not be here. You are here today because God willed and prepared and planned for you to be here. And Jesus would remind us that we should see and treat others in a light manner. Now that's hard for us because we're human. And we have all those human flaws that Jesus obviously doesn't have. But as we grow closer to Jesus, as we include his spirit into our lives, we can begin to accept and love each other more and more like Jesus would. Experiencing God's beauty brings liberty to our hearts. It is an essential aspect of walking each day in victory and of loving God and people with all of our hearts. One of the most powerful weapons that is in God's arsenal against Satan is the beauty of Jesus and what Jesus has done for all of us. It just gets under Satan's skin something else. Because filling our minds and our lives with God's beauty sets us to live in such a way that we can resist fears, we can resist lust and offense and boredom, and we can turn against every temptation that Satan would try to throw at us, to trip us up, to get us to follow him instead of God. But there's another kind of beauty that grows and blossoms with age. It is the unfading beauty. Of a gentle and quiet.
quiet spirit that is learning to trust God more and more with each new day. Trusting Him, obeying God is a most vital step in gaining true beauty. In the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Putting on the righteousness of Christ and learning to be like him more and more as the days go on in our lives, when we are in Christ, the Father doesn't see us as we were, but he sees us who we now are with his beloved Son living within us. And we need to remember that because we've all probably had a history. I mean, if we had to do a slideshow today of each and every one of our lives and all the bad and awful things that we thought or did in our lives, we would uh, be headed for the door, wouldn't we? We wouldn't want people to see and know that about us. Sometimes Satan will dangle that stuff back in our face and say, yeah, remember when you did 40 years ago? Or do you remember when you thought that way? Or when you did this or that or whatever? And he'll dangle that in front of our face. But we need to remember that Christ doesn't see us in that way anymore. He sees us as who we are with his spirit filling with, in filling us. So we need to practice fixing our thoughts on good things in this life. The more we meditate on things that are true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent, and worthy of praise, the more we will shine with God's light and His love and His peace in our lives. We can also practice cultivating the fruit of the Spirit into our lives, living our lives with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those nine things that should dictate how we live our lives in Christ. And that will bring out an uh, outer glow in our lives as we instill those things within our lives. So why are we valuable to God today? Why are we valuable? Three quick things. We're valuable to God because of who we are. We are made in God's image according to His likeness. A long time ago, even before God created us, and before He created this whole world and this universe, we were the focus of His love. Isn't it nice to know that you were thought of and you were planned and purposed long, long, long before you ever were conceived by your mother? He chose us in Him. We were the focus of God's love. And that the focus was that we should accept Him and be holy and without blame before Him in a life of love. The second reason we're valuable to God is that of what we cost. Think about that. What we cost. As one loved by God, we have been chosen by God for adoption. The Bible says we're adopted as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ himself. And that adoption fee came at a very, very high cost. It came as the price of the death of God's son, Jesus. That's what it cost God to pay for us so that we could have a relationship with Him. He made us accepted in the Beloved, and in Him we have redemption through the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. The third thing, we are valuable because of what we can become. As people who are loved by God and adopted into His family, we can be sure that God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. Every one of us, doesn't matter how young we are, how old we are, God has a plan and a purpose for us. We have often seen people laying in beds, lingering in those last days of their life, and we keep wondering, why are they still here? Why doesn't God take them? God has a prescribed time for all things. And I believe that we're still here for a purpose. God knows what that purpose is. So this morning, we want to reflect on the beauty and the value of each other as we are in this place and as we 
share the life of Greta today and as we would have a meal together. I pray and I hope that today you would see each other a little bit more with that love and grace of Jesus. Greta Schultz went to be with Jesus on the 27th of July and she was a person who touched our hearts because she truly saw the beauty and value of God in each of us. And I would have to say that we likewise saw it in her. Her time with us here at Orchard View, albeit short, was always represented by such big smiles, such kindness and gratefulness, and words of affirmation and encouragement. She loved children. We'll find out and hear a little bit more about that in a little bit, but it was very obvious even for our own two children, Nolan and Grace, and she would just look at them and she would just smile, and I could tell she was admiring them, and she would always come to me and she said, you have such beautiful children. And she would always find a way to talk to them at, at a fellowship time or a gathering time to want them to know what their plans were for life. Greta was very giving. Even with what little she had all through her life and growing up, she was always giving away her things to other people because she loved people. She would make you feel loved and safe. And I'm going to try my best today. There are some pronunciations that I may not do very well with, but help me out here. And I guess, uh, she was a, a native of Drammen. Drammen. Drammen, yes. Norway, which isn't far from Oslo, where she actually, there's a picture there that was taken when she went to the university in Oslo. She was born on February the 2nd, 1930, which gave her the name Greta Groundhog. <laughs> February 2nd, Groundhog's Day. So Greta Groundhog. And it has a, a, a alliteration ring to it, doesn't it? She grew up as a young girl under German occupation in Norway during World War II. And Greta didn't talk a lot about a lot of those experiences. And there's maybe a reason why that the people there in Norway saw the German Nazi soldiers but patrolling their land and were told not to relate to them, talk to them. But you know, Greta was just a young girl and she shared that she recalled the soldiers in various places patrolling and guarding. And even though they weren't supposed to interact with them, Greta did as a little girl. She would smile at them and she would gain their attention and she shared once about having um, a connection or a conversation um, a moment with one of the German soldiers. Greta was very active in her younger days. An article printed in the newspaper in Wisconsin, you'll see a frame print of it out on the table, shared about how Miss Greta Halverson, who worked at the local hospital as a secretary to the administrator, shared her skiing experiences in Norway. And you will see her skis out there. Boy, it doesn't look like anything you'd probably get at uh, the ski shops today. But when I, after I read that newspaper article and saw those skis, it was just precious to be able to see them. Greta loved cross-country skiing. And she had shared with a reporter in that article how in Norway, you would spend a whole day skimming the forest and the rugged terrain heading gradually downhill. What you do is you'd start up and you would just take this like all-day trip down the slope, skimming the sides of the trees, but the cool thing was that there were uh, places along the way where you could stop and get um, some hot chocolate or coffee or sandwiches and you could um, warm up a little bit and then you would continue your uh, journey down the hill. And can you imagine in that beautiful rugged terrain with all of the trees, what a beautiful experience she must have had. She, she ended up skiing in many other favorite places. One of her places that she liked to ski was in the Porcupine Mountains of the Upper Peninsula. You're going to hear or find out a lot of things about um, Greta that you didn't know before that will probably like to amaze you today. While she was living in Norway, um, she enjoyed hiking and she also enjoyed working with horses. And she loved to sail and she loved to water ski. Isn't that amazing? When you see her coming in in that water, it's hard to believe that she had all those experiences. But she was younger, she valued education very much, and her schooling allowed her to be able to speak and write in these languages. She spoke and wrote in French, German, English, three different Scandinavian languages. And then she had the audacity to take Spanish class while she was in college. So Greta, for those of us that didn't know, was able to read and write in seven different languages. She would live in 
traveled to many places of the world, but in the December of 1955, Greta came to Waukesha, Wisconsin to visit her sister, and I don't know how to pronounce that, Yordis? Yordis. 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 For Christmas. And for some reason, she just stayed. She stayed in Wisconsin. On September 15, 1964, she married Delbert at the Little Brown Church in the Bay in Nashua, Iowa. And ironically, that church is the historical building where the song Little Brown Church in the Wildwood was inspired, written, and first sung. And in your bulletin today, well, you'll actually see this little picture of the church. I was just curious, uh, Ruth, I know, has been there. Is there anybody here been to the Little Brown Church in the Vale? Here. We, we've heard that you'll recognize the songs. So we're going to sing it in a little bit. But it's very interesting, and I'm not going to read the history, but it is printed there by the song. But way back in 1857, a young music teacher named William Pitts was on a June visit to that area and was on a stagecoach ride, and he stopped, and he got off, and they were resting, and he looked at a beautiful area, and the thought came, wouldn't it be, that'd be the perfect, beautiful place for a little church to be built? And many years later, when he came back, lo and behold, someone had built a church there, a little brown church. And then you can read the rest of the history there, but these were the words that he was inspired to write and put music to as a result of that little church that was there that Karen got to be able to go back recently and visit as she went on a kind of a return trip back to the different places where that her mother uh, lived and took part of in her life. So I believe that uh, Terrence going to come up and, and Ruth's going to come up and we're going to sing the church in the wildwood by William Pitts. And this was a song that was inspired in the place where Greta and her husband Delbert were married in 1964. If you would like to stand, you may obviously the words are in your bulletin. And I'm sure some of you know this song a lot better than I do. So go ahead and sing loud and proud. <laughs>
church is an active church today. Pastor and services and all. So it's nice he didn't make it just a historical marker, but it's an active church. Well, along after that marriage came Karen. She became very close to her father. And sadly, when her father passed away in 1980 at the age of only 44, Greta's perseverance to provide for Karen was clearly evident. Karen became Greta's world, and the two of them would grow closer and closer as the events of life went by. Their relationship was loving, and it was strengthened. Greta valued education, and she was going to make sure that Karen had the opportunity to attend college. And Greta wanted that so much that she would work three jobs, three jobs, to give Karen that opportunity. Last Tuesday, Karen and I were able to talk to Carol Engel, our retired school secretary in Latoma, Wisconsin, who worked with Greta for 12 years but knew her longer from connections with each other's husbands that happened to uh, go to school together and graduated. And Carol shared that Greta loved the children that she worked with in the school. She was excellent at everything she did. She was strict. She was yet very fair. And as a result of that, the kids knew her to be genuine, and so they really, really liked her very much. She was always at school. She never missed. She never uh, missed a day of work, and she would work so very well with the school staff there at the time that uh, Carol mentioned that it seemed like it was a family feeling that they had. The interesting thing, though, Greta always, in, despite everything she was going through to try to make ends meet and work all those jobs to get Karen for school, she was always interested in asking how others were. She always wanted to know about the staff members' lives, how they were doing, and how were their children doing. She was always concerned about others. She always made time to inquire about how life was going for them. And here was a woman who did not have life at all easy for herself. She was widowed. She was taking care of a daughter. She was working hard all day long without ever complaining and being grumpy or negative, always looking for something to be positive about in exchange. And then when a long, tiring day of school had ended after she had invested all that energy in kids, and I'm sure Marissa and April probably know what you first seen my baby at home, is just like, don't talk to me. The crash, the crash of birds. It is, for anybody that's invested in education, it is a very emotionally exhausting. But after the day ended, that wasn't the end of Greta's day to go home and pick up her feet and to relax. She had to head off to the gas company where she had a job in the evenings cleaning because, after all, she needed to make sure Karen got through college. On top of all that, Greta made sure she would attend Karen's sporting events, so she was trying to balance all these different aspects of her life that were packed into her day. And Carol, the secretary, also mentioned that even with Greta doing all of that, she kept a meticulous home. She made sure she took very good care of her vehicles and other things around the house on a limited income. Carol shared that she just was amazed of how Greta was able to do it all. She mentioned that Greta was a wonderful cook and that the school staff always enjoyed those moments when they would provide, when Greta would provide food for them. Greta also worked the summer migrant program. As soon as the regular school year ended, she was just constantly working and keeping busy and doing things. Carol said she was always engaged with kids, a one-of-a-kind person, always so very gracious to all whom she related to. The journey that Greta and Karen would take in the, the latter years of Greta's life would unfold yet new experiences. Probably most of them would be more challenging than any of the others combined. We know that when Greta went to assisted living, Karen faithfully cared for her mom and continued to be her best friend. They would spend moments together sharing memories, 
of love, sharing story, stories about Norway, of her Sunday morning visits here to Orchard View, where she always would sit here on the end, the rows. She loved coming to church. She would always say to the door, it's so beautiful here. Everything is so beautiful. She loved all of you. It was an emotional but healing relationship that Karen and her mother would share in those latter days. Greta loved it from the church. Some mornings when she was not in the mood to really come or to travel, she would come nonetheless, and after being here, Karen said her whole entire disposition seemed to, to change and to lighten up. It tired her out to come. After all, she was the oldest Christian in our church. But she looked forward to coming, and we were always so happy to see her and to hug her at the door. We're going to certainly miss those smiles and those hugs. Greta's life experiences were vast and many. She was comfortable to share the parts of her life that she was comfortable to share, and she was tight-lipped about other things that she didn't want to much discuss. I know there were efforts in our particular community uh, from the, the funeral director that I worked with that uh, had called the Daily News and they were, were, hope, were wanting to get uh, Greta to sit down and do a, an interview with them for a feature story about her experiences of growing up in Norway under, and during the war. And Greta didn't want to have anything to do with it. She, she wanted just to be private about those experiences that must have been very unsettling. They were Karen was sharing stories of the different practices and drills that the kids had to go through in school. Um, if at any time Hitler and the Nazis were to you know, attack their Norway. Karen shared these in her words. She goes, I knew the remaining time that mom had with us was precious. And I just wanted her to find that relationship with God again like I did. And this church, and this church family allowed her to do that. I knew that had to be a part of my journey with my mom. It was very important to me that she found God again before she passed. As Greta neared her final days of life, it was always a blessing to go up and to visit her at Golden Life. I made the mistake once of telling people I was going up to Golden Pond to see Greta and Golden Pond. Isn't that a movie? <laughs> I said, I'm sorry. Golden life. But it was always good to sit and to talk with her. And as obviously, as Greta neared her final days, um, she would still get that smile. And the last time I saw her, when I could tell that things were changing, the last words that came her mouth, she looked at me in that dark near her hospital. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say thank you more than I've heard from Greta. Always thank you. So working for the funeral home and having gone over last details with Karen about when that time came, Karen uh, felt it would be important that um, and comforting for both her and Greta to know that um, I could be there um, during that time. And so I talked with my funeral director and asked that uh, when the call came through that Greta had passed, that I'd be the person that would be called in to be in charge of that, taking care of Greta. And so I had that honor that morning. Actually, Karen beat me to it a few minutes before Mr. Hurst called me. And when that morning of July 27 came, Jesus took Greta's hand so peacefully and took her out of that room. And I had the distinct honor of being able to go single-handedly. I thought I'd be going with somebody, but then God planned it all that way to me, Karen. Karen helped me. She was, she was good. We give her a job. But, but I had the distinct honor of going to Greta and taking her from her bed and taking her back to the funeral home. And, uh, and Mr. Hurst came up and he said, Mike, I'd like you to have the honor of being able to take her to the crematory. Because usually that's something else that will do that. So I said, I would love to do that. So, But this is something that Karen and I know, and Brent knows, and maybe a lot of you don't know. But there was kind of something special. We, we both kind of needed some closure 
to that time. It was just, we just lost her. It was sort of unsettling. And so I went to prepare to take Greta to the crematory. As I went out to the, the car, um, Greta's container was there. And on top of her container was a baby blanket wrapped up. Mr. Hurst said, Mike, he goes, go to have you take Greta down to Rockford. But accompanying her will be a little baby boy that didn't make it. And it was so strange because I knew that Greta was going to, she's gone to heaven. It was like that morning she was going to heaven. And we know in the church of God that little children that die before the age of accountability, God takes them back into his care. And I thought, here's Greta that loved children. And she was walking into heaven and I could just picture her taking the hand of that little, that little baby boy with her who she didn't know in this life and he didn't know her. And together they went to see Jesus. So in the car, driving to Rockford to the crematory, I turned on the radio to Christian music, and Greta and I, of course she sang in heaven, we sang Christian songs all the way there. And as I was getting ready to pull into the, the cremation at uh, Rockford, the fitting song, Jesus Loves Me, saying as I pulled into the driveway, I thought, what a fitting song. For me to have that closure of releasing Greta. The beautiful childhood song, Jesus Loves Me. Here was Greta and this little baby boy. Going off to heaven, while the song, Jesus Loves Me, played. At the, crem at the crematory, there's a young man named Joel that works. And Joel removed Greta from the van at the crematory. And I told him, I said, Joel, we've got a very special woman here. By the way, she's the queen of Norway. So you need to take good care of her because we love her very much. And he said, I will do that. I will take special care of her. Karen had the most wonderful opportunity to get away for a few weeks. And you know she hasn't been here. She got to go back to Wisconsin. She got to not only take her mom with her to uh, go through the burial of the ashes, next to her uh, Greta's husband. It was a truly therapeutic and meaningful trip for Karen. It gave her the closure that she needed that she never really had when her father passed away when she was so young. And so on that day when Greta's ashes were buried there in the cemetery, we did a, a virtual prayer service here from the office of Orchard View Church. And I was able to virtually see Greta go to her final resting place from my office as she was being laid to rest in Wisconsin. But fully knowing that her spirit at that point was with Jesus. As a part of the healing process, Karen wrote a most touching letter to her mom after she passed. And I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but I believe it is a very therapeutic process that each and every one of us should do. To write a letter. Hopefully we write letters and we make connections with people that are important in our life before they pass. But there's one for good closure that we can always write. Did this letter, a letter accompanied her, didn't it? Karen? It accompanied her to her to the cremation. Dear Mom, this is the last letter I will ever write to you. For you're now in heaven with God. And with Daddy. And with your family and your friends. And I hope you were able to gather all my pets and that you were watching over them and caring for them until I join you in heaven one day. As you know, Greta loved pets. I think she was forced to love pets sometimes <laughs> on her place of residence. You'll see on the front of her bulletin, she's loving on Brett and Karen spirits. She knew more about parents than any of the rest of us probably ever would. I miss seeing you. I miss you, Mom. I miss your hugs and kisses just touching you. I miss holding your hand. I miss hearing your voice. I miss those three words, I love you. A piece of my heart has gone with you to heaven, Mom. I can feel the emptiness inside of me. My life is going to change now. But thank goodness I have found God again and a church family who has surrounded me with their love and, and Pastor Mike, the comfort that he's provided to me during this time in my life. Well, you know, it's all God's work. And I'm so happy for all the times you went to church with me, Mom. I wanted you to find God again, too. It was so important to me. 
Mom, I want you to know how much having you as my mother meant to me. You made me feel loved and safe. And you worked so hard to put me through college. Daddy would have been so proud of you. I wish he could have stayed with us longer. But God had other plans for him. And I want you to know that even though I feel sad that you are no longer with me, I know that your spirit is. I will make it because you made me the person that I am today. You taught me about determination and how to persevere when things seem stacked against me. You and Daddy taught me not to quit and to never give up the battle. All the journeys and adventures that we had together are now the memories and experiences that will guide me through the remainder of my own life here on earth. Those are all I have remaining of you. So until we meet again, my little flea from Bogany, Please remember that I will carry you in my heart and live each day of my life feeling proud to be your daughter. And one day, we will be together again. And we will become a family in heaven with God. How great that day will be together with each other for eternity. With all my love, your daughter. I believe God gives those in heaven windows of opportunities from time to time to see and to know where our loved ones back here are experiencing. And I believe God allowed Greta to hear that reading today. And I'm sure there's a smile on her face. I want to do a closing prayer. It's not my prayer, but it's a prayer that I think would be very fitting for this service. As soon as our prayer is done, we have a short video we'd like to, to share about Greta. And then after that video, we're going to sing another one of our favorite songs to close the old rugged cross. And then we'll just have a time of announcements and time to invite you to the luncheon. So would you bow your heads as I read this closing prayer today? Dear God, thank you for initially creating me in a complex and beautiful way. Everything you create and how you created it is on purpose, and that includes me. I tend to look at other people and see what I lack. Give me discernment to realize that those people also have moments of looking outward and feeling like they don't measure up. We are all insecure in some way. It is inevitable in a fallen world that seeing, sees youth and outer beauty as the but when I seek to be more like you and live by your ways, I see the glory and wisdom of inner beauty that grows, not diminishes with age. Help me to see others around me in the same way you see them, with love and potential. And help me to reflect on Bible verses about beauty to hold in my own heart and to share with others. So that every person I see was created in your image. You don't give up on them because they seem like they are beyond help. So I shouldn't either. You continue to seek after them. So help me to delight more and more in you so that I can seek to go beyond my initial impression of another person. Then I will see people as you see them. And your radiance will show beautifully on my face. When I remember that redemption is a beautiful thing, even my feet will be beautiful because I will be a messenger of your good news and of your hope. We thank you, Father, for the life of Greta Schultz. Thank you for allowing her that gentleness of spirit in her life that saw people as beautiful and valuable people from you. And as we thank you for the time that was ours to walk alongside of her in this journey of life, learning from her, sharing life with her. We look forward to that day when all of your people can be joined together in your presence, celebrating our relationship with you and your beautiful son, Jesus. Amen.
I took the supermarket flowers from the windowsill I threw the day old tea from the cup Packed up the photo album Matthew had made Memories of a life that's been loved Took the Garrett Wilson cars and stuffed animals Put the old ginger beer down the sink Dad always told me don't you cry when you're down But mum there's a tear every time that I blink Oh I'm in pieces, it's tearing me up But I know a heart that's broke is a heart that's been loved So I'll sing hallelujah you were an angel in the shape of my mom When I fell down you'd be there holding me up Spread your wings as you go And when God takes you back He'll say hallelujah, you're home Fluffed the pillows, made the bed, stacked the chairs up Folded your nightgowns neatly in a case John said he'd drive then put his hand on my cheek And wiped a tear from the side of my face Now I hope that I see the world as you did Cause I know is a life that's been lived So I'll sing hallelujah You were an angel in the shape of my mom When I fell down you'd be there holding me up Spread your wings as you go And when God takes you back You'll say hallelujah You're home To see the person I have become Spread your wings and I know That when God took you back He said hallelujah, you're home
Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Karen. That was a that was a wonderful service. And we are about ready to have some wonderful food, so I'm not going to keep you very long. Trust me. But we have very one important thing to do. We have normal stuff happening this week, so don't worry. It's all in your bulletin. But Pastor and April, I need you up here. As the rest of you know. Pastor Appreciation Month, and we do very much appreciate your pastor and his family. Uh, they do a lot of work, and um, to be honest, uh, being on being on the board, I have a, a little bit of a special insight into how much they do. Um, but even then, I'm still not sure that I I quite know everything. And um, believe me, it's, it's a lot. Um, so. Just as a church, we just want to take a moment to, to say thank you. This is cards from the people in the church. And so, and this is from, from the church, but you know, us as a board, um, something special for, for the both of you. Um, that's a dinner and a show. So, we appreciate it. We appreciate it of you. So, round of, round of applause for that. Speak and let the, the life of Greta inspire.